Hello, and welcome back. A few days ago, I received a subscriber request to solve a puzzle that recently appeared on the Cracking the Cryptic channel, listed as the hardest Sudoku and how to solve it slowly. I put a link to it in the description box below. That video is about 40 minutes long, which is the longest solving time I have ever seen on that channel. And I have to tell you, the reason they thought that puzzle was so hard and the reason why it took them so long is because they don't look at all the candidates. They fill in a few here and there, apparently using what is known as the Snyder method. And I will be using my own variation of that method in my upcoming pencil and paper course. Now just for the record, I have the utmost respect for those cracking the cryptic guys. They are very good at what they do. So please do not misconstrue this video as some kind of attempt to make them look bad or anything. It is not. But today, to fulfill a subscriber request, we're going to solve that same puzzle using the methods that I teach in my complete course. And you will see that by analyzing all the remaining candidates, we can easily get it done in less than 10 minutes. Now, of course, it's going to take a little longer than that right now because I will be explaining each move and making various marks on the puzzle grid to demonstrate what I'm doing. So that will slow us down a little bit, but you'll get the idea, okay? Here we go. So here is the puzzle. It has 24 givens, and now let's display all the candidates. And there they are. And what I'll do is every time I use a particular solving technique, I'll show the corresponding tutorial number from my complete course in the upper right-hand corner. So if you don't fully understand what I'm doing, you can go back and watch those videos, which will provide you with clear explanations. Okay? Good. As many of you know, I always try to make as many obvious moves as possible before I start cycling through the candidate filters to sort of kickstart the puzzle. So here in block six, we can see we have a hidden single on candidate two. And the reason that's a hidden single is by virtue of what's called cross-hatching. These three green colored twos prevent a two from being in any other unfilled cell in that block. So there can't be any other twos in row five, row six, or column eight, which means this two is the only two left in block six and in row four. So that must be the solution to that cell. Now let's go back. Now the computer thinks this cell can be a one, two, three, six, or seven, because those numbers are not already placed in the row, column, or block in which that cell lies. But we as humans can see that it is the only two in that block and in that row, so it must be the solution, okay? And likewise, if we look in column two, we can see that this cell contains the only candidate five in that column, and therefore it must be the solution to that cell. Now, even though there are other fives in row two and other fives in block one, that has to be the solution because there are no other fives in the column. And this time, the reason that's a hidden single is because of this five up here blocking row one, this five blocking row four, and this five preventing a five anywhere else in block seven. So we can enter a five in this cell, okay? And next, what we have is a naked single here in this cell because there is only a single candidate nine in that cell. And what that means is there are no other possibilities for that cell. Whenever you are using automated candidate lists and you see a single candidate in a cell, that must be the solution for that cell because that means there are no other possibilities. And the reason for that is because this cell can see a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, and a seven, and an eight. So it can only be a nine and you can fill it in just like that. So that creates a naked pair on two and three. And because that naked pair lies in block one and column one, we can remove every other two and three from both the block and the column, just like that. All right. Now next, if you look in block two, we have a naked triple of one, four, and seven. And if you've been watching my videos, you know that I like to cut to the chase. Instead of eliminating four and seven, leaving a two here, you can just straight away enter that two. And here you can enter the five and here you can enter the nine. Now that leaves a naked single on three up here and then a naked single on two in this cell. Now next, down here in block eight, we have a hidden single on candidate five. And the reason that's a hidden single is because these two fives block all the other unfilled cells in that block. So you can enter the five as a hidden single in that cell. 
And likewise, we have another hidden single on candidate five in row six because that is the only five in that row. So we can enter that. And now there is only one more five in the whole puzzle because we have eight of the fives filled in. And whenever that happens, you know you can enter that candidate in that block because it's going to be the only candidate five left in that block. So that is a five. And now the fives are all done. So before we go to the filters, I see one more hidden single down here in row nine, and that's on candidate nine because that is the only nine in that row. So you can fill that in just like that. All right, now before we start looking at the candidate filters, let's go through these same moves one more time, but without all the explanations, as if we were just solving the puzzle normally, okay? So let's restart the puzzle. And we had a hidden single on two in this block, and then a hidden single on five in this column. And that left a naked single here on nine. And now we've got a naked pair of two and three, so we can eliminate all these twos and all these threes. All right? Now we've got a naked triple up in block two, and that means this is a two, that's a five, and that's a nine. And now we have a naked single on three and a naked single on two. Then we notice down here in block eight that these two fives in row seven and row nine created a hidden single in row eight, okay? Then we had a hidden single on five in row six, and then there was only one five left, and that's here in block five, so that had to be a five. And then we noticed that there was a hidden single on nine in row nine. That's the only nine in that row. Now, of course, all those hidden and naked singles would have eventually shown up with the candidate filters, but by being able to see them with your eyes, it will really speed up your solving time. So that took less than 60 seconds, and we already have 12 numbers filled in. So now let's move to the candidate filters. Okay, so here are all the ones, and we can see in block two we've got some locked candidates. One of those two ones has to be true. That means these two have to be false. And there's nothing else there, so let's move to candidate two. And down here we've got a dead swordfish. And what I mean by that is there are no eliminations to be made, even though you can see this as a swordfish in the columns or in the rows. So let's move on to candidate three. And again, we've got some lock candidates, and you can see this as type one or type two. These two threes have to be false. Let's move on to the fours. Again, we've got some lock candidates down here in the same place. These two fours have to be false. And the fives are all done, so we can skip those and move on to the sixes. Now here on the sixes, we have a two string kite. We have a strong link from this six up to that six. And we have a strong link from this six over to this six. And we have a weak link in between. Okay? So that means the six in this red cell has to be false because it can see those two endpoint sixes. But what's also going on here is we have an empty rectangle on candidate six as well as a finned swordfish. So let's take a look at all that. So down here in block nine, we've got our empty rectangle pattern in the shape of an upside down T. And then our conjugate pair is over here in column one. The blue cell is candidate A, and the yellow cell is candidate B. And the blue cell lies in the same row with the empty rectangle. And that means this candidate six has to be false because it is in the same column with the empty rectangle, and it can see candidate B. So again, that candidate six is false. And then we have one last way to look at this, and that is as a thinned swordfish in column one, column seven, and column nine. And there's your fin. So once again, the candidate six in that red cell has to be false and we can eliminate it. All right, let's move on to candidate seven. And there's nothing there, so let's move on to candidate eight. And again, down here in block eight, we have some locked candidates. That means these two eights must be false. And again, you can see that as type one or type two. So now let's move to candidate nine, and we have another dead swordfish. So now let's take a look at the bi-value cells. Now if you take a look up here in the top horizontal chute, you'll see that we have what's called an XY wing. Here is the pivot cell, and these are called the pincer cells. Now there's a strong link between the two candidates in each of those three cells, and there's a weak link between the two eights in row one, and there's a weak link between the two fours in block one. That means there's an effective strong link between the two yellow colored sevens, 
which further means that any candidate seven that can see both of them can be eliminated as false. And in this position, there are three. We've got one here, here, and here, and they can all be eliminated as false. Now that leaves a naked single here, a naked single here, a naked single here, and a naked single there. So now let's go back to the filter on candidate one. And here we have another empty rectangle pattern. We've got a periscope shape here in block six, and our conjugate pair is again in column one. That's candidate A and candidate B, except this time we're looking at candidate one. So that proves that the candidate one in this cell has to be false and you can eliminate it. And what that does is it creates a naked pair in this block of seven and six. So we can eliminate that seven and that six, okay? Now let's get rid of that. Now let's go back to the by value cells because I can see an XY chain. So we're gonna start up in this cell on candidate seven and then connect to this eight, then connect to that four, to that one, and then to that six, and finally to the seven. So the two sevens are the endpoints of that chain, and so any seven that can see both of them will be false, and that's this candidate seven right there can be eliminated as false. Now, as I said earlier, if you don't understand how that works, please refer to the associated tutorial, which in this case is number 28 on XY chains. All right, so now that we just eliminated that candidate seven, let's take a quick look at the filter for candidate seven because I think something has changed. If you look up in block three, we now have some locked candidates on candidate seven, which means this candidate seven has to be false, right? And now we've got a naked pair of one and six in row five. So we can eliminate that six, that one, that one, that six, that one, and that six, okay? And now that we've eliminated a lot of sixes, let's take a look at the filter for candidate six, and you will see that we have a swordfish. So it's in row two, row five, and row nine, and that allows us to eliminate this candidate six, okay? Now the next step is going to be a W wing. We have two identical bi-value cells on one and six here and here, and they are connected by this conjugate pair of one and one. So that means one of the two yellow sixes must be true, which means this six has to be false, okay? And then that produces an X-wing on candidate six in column three and column eight. So that means we can remove this candidate six, leaving this six as a hidden single. Everybody good on that? So now let's get rid of those colors. Now this naked triple of one, four, and seven has been sitting here in column four for a while, so let's get that out of the way before we move on. And this allows us to eliminate this one, and this seven, and this one, and this seven. We could have made those same eliminations earlier, but it wouldn't have changed anything else we've done, so we're good. All is well. So now let's get rid of those colors. And now if we cycle through the filters, you will see that there are no simple moves left. Okay, so that tells us that it's time to look for something a little more complicated, like a longer chain or a sous de coq, etc. So let's highlight the bi-value cells. And there are quite a few bi-value cells, and there are also quite a few conjugate pairs, especially on candidates 2, 3, 4, and 8. And as it turns out, we have an AIC type one that begins and ends on candidate four. So let's go back and highlight the fours. And we're gonna start here on this four up here in row one, column four, and make a strong link to this four. Then weak to the eight. Now let's highlight the eights. We've got a strong link down to this eight, a weak link to this eight, and a strong link to that eight, okay? Then we've got a weak link to the three, a strong link to this three, let's highlight the threes. And then we have a weak link to this two, and now let's highlight the twos. We have a strong link to this two, a weak link to this two, and a strong link to that two. And then we have a weak link to this four, and let's highlight the fours again, and we have a strong link up to this four. So the chain begins on this blue four in row one, and it ends on the yellow four in row two. So here's what the chain looks like. 
So there's an effective strong link between those two endpoint fours, which means that any other candidate four that can see both of them can be eliminated as false. And here in this position, there are three of them. There's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. Those three fours can be eliminated. And notice that this yellow four up in row one is part of the chain, but because it can see both of the endpoint fours, it can be eliminated as false. Now, something like this may seem hard to find at first, but with a little practice and experience, it's really not that difficult to see. So let's get rid of all those colors and make those eliminations. And now we're left with a bunch of naked singles. We've got one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. And now we've got a naked pair of one and three in column two, so we know that must be a four. And we have another naked pair of one and eight over here in row eight, so we can eliminate this one and enter the two in that cell. And now we have another hidden single on two in row eight, which leaves a hidden single on four in the same row and another hidden single on four up here in block five. So now the twos, the fours, and the fives are all done. So let's get rid of those colors and let's go back to the filter on candidate one. And we have a skyscraper on candidate one. Here are the two endpoints and here are the two connecting cells. So those two ones in the yellow cells are the endpoints and we know that one of them must be true, which means we can eliminate any other candidate one that can see both of them and there is only one and it's right here. That candidate one is false. So if we eliminate that, we've got a naked single here and a naked single here and then as you will see, it's nothing but naked singles after that and the puzzle is solved. So that wasn't too bad, was it? Aside from that AIC, it was all pretty much just simple stuff. And there you have it. By using the techniques that I describe in my complete course, I would rate this puzzle about medium difficulty. Puzzles that are any harder than this cannot generally be solved with only the Snyder method and will most likely require the use of chains, loops, and other patterns that will be virtually impossible to find without being able to see all the remaining possible candidates and knowing how to carefully analyze them. So please check out my complete course when you can, and for those of you who still like to do printed puzzles found in newspapers, books, and magazines, please keep an eye out for my new pencil and paper method. Okay, that's going to do it for today. Don't forget to click the red subscribe button and the little bell icon if you would like to be notified of new video uploads. And I will look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. In the meantime, be well and be happy.